welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. Good morning, everyone. Towns, villages, cities in Wisconsin, throughout the great Midwest and nationwide. My name is Jim Santel. This is Morning Cannolis, and we are coming to you from the studios of WAUK Radio in downtown Waukesha, the Shah, 540 AM, 101 FM. This is our 11th show since starting these broadcasts in early June, and I am delighted. I'm honored that you've decided to spend some time with me this morning talking in weekend review about the important stories in law, in government, and the aspiration for justice in America. Delighted to have you with me and delighted to spend some time this morning talking in particular about some very significant cases, some significant events in the history of America just this past week. I'm joined in the studio this morning by my colleague and my producer, Calvin. And during the course of the next two hours, we're going to be taking your calls coming in at 844-967-2789. That number, once again, is 844 Six seven two seven eight nine. We have an ambitious but achievable syllabus for you this morning, as we always do. A special program this morning, again, premised upon two significant events this past year in connection with the release of documents coming out of the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., as directed by courts of the federal government. We'll talk about that more in just a moment or so. We're going to be spending most of our time today focusing on what those two documents mean, what their import is. And at the end of our second hour today, I'm going to spend some time with you talking about the reasons why these events of this past week are very important, the conclusions we draw from these particular documents, even after we spend some time in the next two hours talking about their content, their import, why they're right, why they're wrong, and the things that as all Americans we should understand about these two important releases this past Past week. Before we get to all of that, I want to spend some time commending once again my lead-in colleague, uh, Don Brown, who does This Week in Waukesha so very well. Once again this morning, coming to you from the farmer's market right down the street here in Waukesha. Beautiful, sunny morning, a Saturday morning here in Waukesha. Don, Don was my invited guest to be here this morning, and because of the importance of the matters we're going to be talking about, these two issued documents. I've asked Don to come back next week, next week, Saturday, September 3rd, when we can spend a lot of time talking about issues here in Waukesha, in Wisconsin, again, throughout our nation. So we've got enough time to engage in the kind of banter and discussion that Don is so very good at. We started that last week on his show, promised he'd be back here this this weekend. Unfortunately, because of the content of today's show, anticipating your phone calls and also lots of things to talk about, I've asked Don to come in next week as opposed to this week, and we'll very much look forward to that, as we will to his broadcast next Friday, and then again next Saturday from the Farmer's Market here in Waukesha. As always, as always, this is a review of the important stories in law, in government, and aspiration for justice in America. We begin this morning, as always, talking about things in history, things that happen on August 27th in the history of our world and the history of our nation. This is the 239th day of the year of 2022. There are 126 days remaining on your calendar. Eight, eight very significant things in the history of our lives and the lives of people who preceded us that happened on August 27th in the history of our world and in our nation. In 1859, in this country, in a place called Titusville, Pennsylvania, the first time the petroleum was discovered under the ground, and that produced the world's first commercially successful oil well in 1859. We know how significant that was not only in connection with motor vehicles, but many other things coming out of the commercial sale and development of oil products. We know, we know that that remains a highly, highly relevant issue. Even as this past week, California, California announced that in just a few short years, it's going to prohibit the sale of gasoline-powered 
cars in that state. But 1859, petroleum discovered in the ground for the first time in Titusville and the world's first commercially successful oil well at that time. 1908, 1908, a few years later, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who would go on to be the 36th president of the United States of America, was born. He was born on this day in 1908. Another significant connection to recent events. He died on January 22nd of 1973 at the very young age of 65. That was the same day, the same day that the United States Supreme Court issued its decision, now overturned in Roe v. Wade. But in 1908, on August 27th, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the 36th president, also the president who signed major civil rights legislation in the history of our nation, born on this day in 1908. 1928, 1928, a couple of decades later, the Kellogg-Briand Pack, the Kellogg-Briand Pack, what did that say? Well, it was a work put together by the Secretary of State of the United States Department of, of the State and of our nation and the Foreign Minister of France, a fellow named Aristide Briand, Frank Kellogg, got together and put together a pact, a document that did what? It supposedly intended to, good intentions, to outlaw war after World War I. It was signed initially by 15 countries, including Germany and France and the United States. Eventually, 61 nations signed off on it. The intention to prohibit war on the face of this planet. As we know, a wonderful aspiration, plainly an aspiration not realized as just a few years later, World War II breaks out, and we know about the history of the 20th century and the 21st century involving wars across our nation, including those that continue to this very day. Other events in the life and livelihood of our time. 1962 was the day that the Mariner II uh, unmanned space mission was launched to Venus. Venus, again, recently in the news because very many, many scientists are looking to Venus to re-examine whether there's a possibility of life out there on that second planet. But Mariner 2 in 1962 launched to the Venus planet. Uh, interestingly, it was also on this day in 2003 that Mars, Mars, uh, be just beyond us in the opposite direction, made its closest approach to Earth in some 60,000 years. Mar August 27th of 2003, Mars comes as close to the planet Earth as it has been in 60,000 years. For those of you keeping track at home, that's about 35 million modest miles distant from our place of life. That happened in 1962. Something more lighthearted, 1964, Mary Poppins, the original, the original Mary Poppins had its world premiere in Los Angeles. The screen debut of a young star Star named Julie Andrews in 1964. Other significant things on that date. 1979. Very serious story. A very serious time in the British Isles, and in particular Ireland and Northern Ireland. The time of what's called the Troubles. 18 British soldiers were killed in an ambush on this day in 1979 by the Provisional Irish Republican Army in Northern Ireland. That was one of the deadliest attacks ever in that many years long conflict in that part of the world. On the same day, the same day in 1979, August 27th, an IRA bomb killed British royal family member Lord Mountbatten and three others on his boat in Ireland called the Troubles in 1979. A couple of other events in 2008, on this day in 2008 was the day that a senator from the state of Illinois named Barack Obama was nominated by the Democratic Party as its candidate to be assume the presidency of the United States of America. Of course, as you all know, he would go on to defeat John McCain in the general election later that year and stay in office for two years. I was honored during the course of his term to be nominated by him and confirmed by the United States Senate to serve as the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of Wisconsin during that term of Senator and then President Barack Obama. And finally, Finally, a very sobering event in 2011, uh, not that long ago. 
2011, August 27th, was the day that Hurricane Irene made landfall in the United States, in North Carolina in particular. The Outer Banks and the Eastern Seaboard hit dramatically, catastrophically by Hurricane Irene. Damage of more than $15 billion, with a B, dollars. One of the most expensive disasters in American history, killing nearly 50 people. Killing nearly 50 people on August 27th of 2011. A whole series of events, again, significant events happening on this day in history. As I indicated, our agenda today is serious. It is ambitious, and we again invite your phone calls along the way at 844-967-2789. Calvin is going to be working with me and getting your calls in. We've got a lot of things to talk about in connection with these two big news stories of this past week. The first one of them happening on Wednesday, the second just yesterday in our nation, coming out of our nation's capital on Wednesday, on Wednesday, at the direction of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, following some review, lots of litigation by a lower court, lots of review, lots of litigation by attorneys at Maine Justice and in the courts of the District of Columbia. The courts, the federal courts, order the release of a memorandum that was issued three years ago put together three years ago by officers of the United States Department of Justice in something called the Office of Legal Counsel. And why is this memorandum important? Why are we talking about it three years later? Well, again, I'm going to be spending a lot of time at the end of our second hour chatting about why both of these things that happened this week are very, very important in our history, not just to know about today, but to know about for all time. This particular memo, dated March 24th of 2019, now over three three years old, was issued at the time to describe to then Attorney General, when, uh, Attorney General William P. Barr a basis for coming to conclusions about the Mueller report. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning giving you some history, some background of what that was all about. And I'm going to give you a warning that in connection with my assessment and the assessment of many other people, the memorandum that we're going to be talking about today, now finally released, directed to be released by the federal courts, is, in the words of one a very learned commentator and many others who've taken a look at this five or six or seven page document, flat out wrong on the facts and the law. A stunning memorandum to be released today, but important in understanding the history of 2019. When William Barr, the then Attorney General, described for the first time what the findings of the Mueller report were all about, premised in part upon this memorandum, changing forever, I would argue, the narrative history about what the Mueller report does and does not say. I'm going to talk more about that significant memorandum when we come back right after the break. Once again, this is Morning Cannolis sampling the news desserts of this week. This week, including two very important documents coming out of the United States Department of Justice. Join me. And we're back. This is Morning Cannolis. We're talking this morning about two very important documents released this past week on Wednesday and again just yesterday on Friday by the United States Department of Justice with the authorization and the direction of federal courts in the United States of America. Right before the break, I began to chat about this memorandum written to then Attorney General William P. Barr describing the Mueller report. For those of you who are planning your morning in our second hour beginning at 10 o'clock this morning, the second hour of Morning Cannolis, we're going to turn to the significant event, the release of the document yesterday, the supporting affidavit that justified probable cause to enter into the premises of Mar-a-Lago, the former president's residence and office. We're going to talk about that document, and then at the end of the day, we're going to be chatting about the reasons why these two documents are not only important, but how they're connected, and the direct, direct relationship between them, the importance of his History and beyond that. Again, uh, we are encouraging you to join us at 844-967-2789 as we launch into right now this discussion of this very significant memorandum that came out of the United States Department of Justice just this past Wednesday. Let me go back and do a little bit of history on this, some of which you 
probably know, virtually all of which you probably know, a little bit of detail around the edges as well. You may recall well that Rod Rosenstein, who at that time was the Deputy Attorney General of the United States of America, the second in command. Jeff Sessions was the Attorney General of the United States of America, the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer uh, for the entire nation. At that time, there had been sufficient reason inside the Federal Bureau of Investigation to be concerned about whether or not there was Russian involvement in the 2016 election. Recall that well. And as a result of that, Rod Rosenstein, again, in his position as the Deputy Attorney General, decided to commission a report, to commission a, an investigation leading up to a report, finding, determining whether whether or not there was indeed some connection between Russia's involvement in our election, the results of it, were they meddling, were they involved in some way, and that's what gave rise ultimately, I'm skipping over a fair amount of significant information here, ultimately to the appointment of a fellow named Robert Mueller, Robert Mueller, M-U-E-L-L-E-R. Mr. Mueller had previously served as the Deputy Attorney General. He was a United States Attorney in San Francisco for many years. He was the Director of the FBI prior to that time, and he was pulled out of retirement to determine whether or not, again, there was this connection between the Russian involvement in our nation through social media, through various companies, other things, and the 2016 election, commissioned once again by the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in the wake of a years-long investigation, most of which, virtually all of which, was not in the public domain appropriately. Uh, Bob Mueller issued a report. It's nearly 500 pages long. It's a lot to consume, and it is, as I've often said on this wonderful radio station, it is in many ways a prosecution memorandum. It's a description not only of what he found, but also about the bases upon which a prosecuting authority or or on Capitol Hill, an impeaching authority could bring a case against the former president for obstruction of justice. Before even getting to that, however, Robert Mueller divided his report into two major sections. The first one, focusing upon his principal assignment from Rod Rosenstein. That first portion of the report, determining in the end that while there was parallelism, there was a certain amount of symmetry, there seemed to be not direct connections, but an awful lot of awareness of each other, the Russian entities that were the focus of the Mueller investigation and the Trump campaign did not, in fact, conspire. No reason to believe, based upon what Mueller put together, no reason to believe that there was a formal conspiracy and agreement between them to undermine the election. And that's a significant finding. And that's exactly what the report said in the first 200 or so pages of it. There was an awful lot of discussion at the time about this word collusion. Robert Mueller went to great length to explain rightly, accurately, that collusion is not a, a term of legal art, uh, that rather the question is whether or not there was a conspiracy. And again, he found there was no factual basis, there was no legal basis to conclude that the Trump administration had indeed conspired with Russia in its individual capacities or generally to undermine, to affect the 2016 election. That's the first portion of the Mueller report. The reason why the events of this past week are so important is because we focus then upon the second, also 200 pages of materials in the Mueller report. And what did Bob Mueller go on to do? Um, as a part of the broad commission given to him by, by the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Bob Mueller went on to catalog to describe and to detail, in great detail, the specific instances in which the now former president, then sitting president, Donald Trump, had attempted to obstruct the investigation of the Russia inquiry itself. In other words, during the course of that investigation, were there things that the former president, while he was in the Oval Office in the White House, did to try to stop that investigation? And again, over a period of about 200 pages or so, some of which we'll talk about this morning, only because it's relevant to this memorandum, during the course of that 200 pages of findings, heavily documented, specific references to people talking about specific events, things said by the presidents, things said by people around him, uh, documents and, and other strong indicia of obstruction of justice. Bob Mueller identifies 10 
10 particular instances in which a prosecutor or an impeaching authority might find that there was obstruction. And he releases this report and he says significantly that the reason why, the reason why he is not and cannot recommend a prosecution of the president based upon what he's identified as 10 of these instances of obstruction is that there exists, as we have talked about in great detail, a memorandum inside the Department of Justice that prohibits the prosecution of a sitting president for crimes. It is not a statute. It's not a constitutional mandate, but it's been around for about 20 years in the wake of Watergate and other events in American history, an office called the Office of Legal Counsel, once again coming back to the issues of Justice Week, issued this memorandum saying, you know what, you can't prosecute or you should not prosecute a sitting president. And so Bob Mueller said, you know what, I can't do it based upon what I've found and an awful lot of people, including me, um, believe that what Bob Mueller did instead was to author a report to be presented to the Congress to determine whether or not it should impeach on events that the Department of Justice could not prosecute on. We know the history there, which is that there was not a choice to, to impeach on these issues. Nonetheless, um, a, a compelling report about obstruction of justice. And along the way, along the way prior to the release of that report, and this gets us to the specific memorandum of this past week, Bill Barr, Bill Barr, before the public announcement of it, came forward and did a couple of things. He issued a letter, a four-page letter to Congress, and then talked publicly to the American population about what it said. Right after the break, we're going to tell you more about what he said at the time and the basis for that report to America, to Congress, from this memorandum. Join us right after the break as we get into the meat, the heart of this memorandum of this past week. Welcome back. Good morning. Once again, this is Jim Santel reviewing with you this morning the events leading up to the announcement by the former Attorney General, William Barr, about what was and was not in the Mueller report, this compendium, this 500-page document issued by Special Counsel Robert Mueller, the former director of the FBI, former U.S. attorney, making findings about what happened in connection with the Russia involvement, if any, with the 2016 election. We know there was a lot, but not in particular relationship with the Trump administration, and more importantly, focusing upon obstruction of justice. Robert Mueller, as I said before the break, identified 10, probably six to eight of these prosecutable instances where the former president engaged in conduct in the nature of obstruction of justice. And so this report gets delivered to the attorney general way back on March 22nd of 2019. It is not yet released into the public domain. And two days later, two days later on March 24th, the attorney general releases a, a four-page memorandum, a four-page letter to the Congress in which he basically says that, yes, with respect to Russia, nothing there to see, no conspiracy, which is accurate in terms of what the report said. But then he goes on to say, oh, by the way, I and the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, have also re reviewed the report and determined there is no basis upon which to prosecute the former president at that time, the president, for obstruction of justice. And it is that report, that finding, if you will, that representation repeated on the very day, on April 18th, when the report was finally publicly released to all of us, to all of you, to the Congress, to everyone else. It is that second finding that the report does not, in fact, support a, a finding, a predicate for prosecuting for obstruction of justice that was the focus of so much attention and so much focus. Why? Because those of us who did, and I suspect many of you have read, if not the entire 500-page opus, lots of it, you come away, you are absolutely convinced, based upon Bob Mueller's assessment, that there are instances, many of them prosecutable, of obstruction of justice. So this complete disconnect, if you will, between what the Attorney General had written and 
what he had said days after, 48 hours after getting this report to the Congress and to the American public, a narrative that I would offer remains to this day. People believing that with respect to both portions of the Mueller report, there is no finding. There was no finding of obstruction of justice when, in fact, Bob Mueller had said just the opposite. Bob Mueller would go on in July when he was testifying before the Congress about this to explicitly say that what the attorney general had reported was not accurate. He went on to say uh, that is not what our report said. He wrote to the attorney general shortly after the attorney general was announcing these things and said, you have misconstrued what we said. You have not accurately described what my report says. And so he took him on directly, but nonetheless, the narrative took hold. And the question, the question that comes from all of that history is, where did the attorney general get this notion that the report, contrary to what he said, and contrary to what every single analyst out there who's honest about the report has reported on it, Where did he get that notion? Where did that come from? Well, it turns out that, and we've known this for a long period of time, that the Office of Legal Counsel, an office inside the Department of Justice, in particular the staff there and two of the the, uh, assistant attorneys general inside that office, had authored a seven-page memorandum internal to the Department of Justice given to the attorney general within hours, if you will, after his, his receipt of the report and prior to his announcement about what this report said said. And it's that memorandum, that seven-page memorandum that was finally released this past week for a number of years, many years, frankly, three years, the Department of Justice under both administrations had had declined to release this internal memorandum on the basis it was deliberative in nature, that it was the result of the back and forth, the discussion being had. And in the end, a district court judge named Amy Berman Jackson in Washington, D.C. said, you know, I'd, I'd buy that if there was truly some deliberation. The problem with this is that that this memorandum basically codifies a decision already made. And that's one of the first points that you pull away from the memorandum when you read it now, that as Amy Bourbon Jackson thought when she reviewed the memorandum, this is not the result of a deliberative process. This was a result of being directed uh, to justify a decision and provide behind the scenes, if you will, explanations for what it is that the attorney general was saying. And so just this past week, the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit affirmed Amy Burnham Jackson and said, nope, Department of Justice, you got to release it. And so the Merrick, Merrick Garland, the present attorney general, did just that. What does this memorandum say? What does it reveal about the Office of Legal Counsel under the Barr administration? And what should we take away from it in terms of meaning? Well, a number of different things. First of all, comes to the conclusion that the evidence described in the second portion of the report is not in our judgment, according to the Assistant Attorneys General, Office of Legal Counsel, who wrote it, sufficient to support a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt that the president violated the obstruction of justice statutes. And goes on to to describe in the following pages the bases for that. I'm going to spend some time in the remaining moments of this hour talking with you about the reasons why that report, again, is inconsistent with what Bob Mueller said. It is inconsistent with the law and inconsistent with the facts as they're set forth in in that volume. A stunning memorandum that, again, is accessible, should be read if you have the time, uh, by all Americans who are interested in these kinds of things. Along the way, along the way, the authors of the memorandum said, you know, even though the uh, special counsel himself chose not chose not to make a specific specific prosecution decision here. We're going to do that. And so recommended, and the Attorney General did choose not to prosecute at all. Along the way, saying this, while cataloging the actions the President took, many of which took place in public view, again, a first interesting comment that somehow the fact that many of these obstructive acts were in the public view, that that makes a difference, it does not. It does not under the law. But nonetheless, highlighted by the authors of this memorandum for the Attorney General. The report identifies, they say, no actions that in our judgment constituted obstructive acts done with a nexus to pending proceedings with the corrupt intent necessary to warrant prosecution under the obstruction of justice statutes. And then they go on to talk about the bases for that particular finding. Let me identify two or three of the fundamental errors in law 
that many people have identified in this memorandum, shocking, stunning, surprising, coming out of the Office of Legal Counsel, which is supposed to be this office inside the Department of Justice that provides information, candid information, direct information to the Attorney General so that he or she can make appropriate decisions about policy and prosecution. Listen to what the folks who wrote this memorandum say. They, they first of all begin by saying that there's no precedent for this, that there's nothing that we can identify in the law, in the past uh, history of cases uh, that would support this kind of prosecution. They cite a couple of cases, uh, but indeed along the way, uh, they fail to acknowledge that there are all kinds of, of, of justifications for uh, precedents that would, would support prosecutions for this kind of thing. It is common for people to look at this memorandum and say today that if you and I, if other people, not the president of the United States of America, were to engage in these kinds of, of prosecutorial or rather obstructive events, we would in fact be prosecuted. And in fact, the, the, the notion that there is not a precedent for this is simply belied by tens of uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years of history of prosecution in America. More significantly than that, listen to what the memorandum says about the predicates for a prosecution for obstruction of justice. They say this, um, given the, this conclusion, the evidence does not establish a crime of criminal conspiracy involving the president to, toward which any obstruction or attempted obstruction by the president was directed. It would be rare for federal prosecutors to bring an obstruction prosecution that did not itself arise out of a proceeding related to a separate crime, a separate crime. And so what does that mean? Why is that, that also very, very important? They're talking about the notion that in order to prosecute for obstruction of justice, you've got to have an underlying offense conduct. That is, you have to have found in this case that the president engaged in a conspiracy with the Russians before, before you can charge for obstruction of justice. Justice. And that, as anyone who knows these kinds of things, who's prosecuted cases in federal and state forums, that is simply a misstatement of the law. And I would offer that the authors of this, high-level people at the Office of Legal Counsel, know better when they describe this. It is an impediment to bringing a prosecution of the president based upon this notion that he was not, in fact, found reliable, or found responsible, rather, reliably responsible for the events itself related to Russia. That is the first of several problems with this memorandum. Uh, again, this notion that you need a predicate, a predicate offense conduct, a finding of that, maybe even a conviction, before you can charge for, for an obstruction of justice. Plainly not the case, as many people have observed. How could that possibly be? If you're successful in obstructing justice, there will be no finding. We'll talk about some other problems with this memorandum in our last few moments of this hour into the next hour as we're chatting here on Morning Cannolis about this memorandum coming out of the Office of Legal Counsel three years ago, just released this past week. Once again, talking with you, involving you, if you wanted to call in at 844-967-2789 about the significant problems with this memorandum issued three years ago, just about in the spring of 2019, suggesting that there was nothing in the Mueller report in the nature of obstruction of justice that would support a prosecution of the president. The premise, the theory, the advocacy this morning, not just from me, but from many other people who looked at this memorandum, that the memorandum itself rife with problems legally and factually. Right before the break, I expressed this concern that somehow the fact that some of these events happened in the public domain made a difference. They do not. That there was no precedent for this, according to the memorandum. Also not true. An awful lot of precedent out there for prosecuting someone who is engaged in this kind of, of obstructive conduct. And then talking specifically about this notion that in order to prosecute anyone for an obstructive event, you need to have an underlying crime that has been known, been identified, perhaps even beyond a reasonable doubt. Again, simply a misstatement of the law, um, contrary to policy, contrary to practice, contrary to common sense. Another problem with the memorandum as it's set forth, as we've now received it this past week, discussion about 
how many of these events did not, in fact, result in anything specific, that they were attempts. They were attempts to engage in underlying uh, obstructive acts, but they were not successful. The president directed other people to do things and uh, explained that they should do things on his behalf. They didn't do them, and because they did not go forward or the events themselves did not result in obstruction, that that is a reason for, that is a reason for our change in the findings of the under underlying case. That is a reason for finding that the obstruction did not happen. What is the problem with that? Once again, a misunderstanding of the law, fundamental law coming out of law school, criminal prosecution, that attempt in and of itself is a crime. You do not have to consummate. You don't have to achieve the crime itself, whatever that might be. And it is simply a misstatement of law in this memorandum by these folks in the Office of Special Counsel that in order for the former president to have been prosecuted, they have had to have been uh, successful in undermining the underlying investigation. Not true. A, an attempt is significant. An attempt is a crime in and of itself. And then there's also some additional language that is concerning. Discussion about how the president's conduct here was not motivated by any ill intent, by any mal purpose, but rather was simply the product of some political interest. Um, to avoid a personal embarrassment, as the report says, personal embarrassment, uh, public focus, and that if that is the case, uh, that that because of personal embarrassment and, and political concerns are the motivation for your engaging in conduct, there can be no prosecution for obstruction of justice. Once again, a fundamental misunderstanding, a conflation, if you will, of motive and intent. You can have many motives that could be well-intended politics could be one of them avoiding personal embarrassment could be another but you can still have the intent therefore to violate the law that is a fundamental principle first year second year law school prosecutors around the country know that well. The mere fact that there may be a motive premised upon politics or as the memorandum says, uh, the president concerned about the cloud on his nascent, his early administration uh, time at, at that period of time, this is early 2017, that that's his motive and for that reason the intent could not possibly support a prosecution for obstruction of justice. Today, I will offer to you, as I have with respect to these other points, that that is simply a misstatement of law. And the assistant attorneys general, even as they are writing this memorandum, have to know it. They make reference during the course of this memorandum to something called the Principles of Federal Prosecution, which is this publicly available set of guidelines that provide policy and direction, all sorts of legal standards as well, about the bases, the reasons why prosecution is undertaken, and the practical approaches as you go forward and prosecute someone for violations of federal criminal law. It is fundamental in those principles that these notions about predicates, about attempt, about motive versus intent, all of those are implicit, if not explicit, in the very principles of federal prosecution that the authors of this memorandum invoke to support a finding that there is no basis to go ahead with a prosecution of the former president for obstruction of justice. Huge problems with this memorandum called to the attention of Americans generally in the past three days as this has broken loose. Beyond that, beyond the misstatements of law, lots of misstatements of fact as well. And Bob Mueller, as I indicated earlier, both in testimony to the United States Congress and in letters written to the Attorney General himself, contemporaneous with the Attorney General then coming around and saying, based upon my advice from the Office of Legal Counsel, I'm not doing anything with this. There's no predicate for prosecution. The other problem that Bob Mueller himself identified was a misstatement of fact. And indeed, the memorandum spends a lot of time talking about some of these specific events, including, for example, the president's directing Don McGahn at the time to author some made-up reports about whether or not uh, the president had uh, directed the firing of the uh, FBI director, um, asking the Don McGahn to deny re newspaper reports that, that the president had directed him to fire special counsel in particular, um, making up reports about those kinds of things. And, and because of the focus of that among eight or nine other instances, the 
authors of this memorandum, this internal document to the attorney general at that time, find that indeed uh, there was nothing wrong there, that, that the, the events as properly interpreted um, uh, cast significant doubt on whether or not, as they say, the president actually sought to induce Don McGahn to lie. I have to believe that Bob Mueller today, if he's reading this memorandum, which he may or may not have seen previously, and recalling his investigation of the McGahn incident, among the many others, again, this attempt by the president to tell McGahn to author some memorandum indicating that the president had never, ever, ever uh, directed the firing of the special counsel in this case. You have to believe that Bob Mueller today would look back on that and say once again, a misstatement, a misstatement of fact as set forth in this memorandum, a misstatement about what the Mueller report, what the findings of the investigation actually said. And so once again, lots of things like that in this memorandum that are simply misstatements of what Bob Mueller intended. And they seize upon the notion, they seize upon the notion that Bob Mueller himself, because he was prohibited from going ahead with this internal memorandum to make specific findings of guilt, that therefore, therefore, they're going to make the choice. The attorney general makes the determination that Bob Mueller does not. If you read through the second portion of that report, that Mueller report of now three years ago, you come to a very different conclusion. And I would offer that anyone who has done that, people on all sides of the political aisle who've done that, came to the conclusion that indeed, if you could have prosecuted a president, there would be a basis for doing it, also a basis for what it's worth to impeach him at the time, a decision made by the United States Congress not to go ahead with any of that. There's a very interesting discussion in the course of this memorandum as well about flipping, about the president's public statements exhorting witnesses like Flynn and Manafort and Stone and Cohen not to flip and that the suggestion was in Mueller's report that those should be viewed as obstruction of justice that the report itself makes very clear that this was an attempt to intimidate witnesses to try to get them to describe their engagements with the president in a way that is inconsistent with the facts and therefore also obstruction of justice uh, the the memorandum released this past week goes in just the opposite direction and says once again that these public statements of the president um, were just defending himself. Says once again, the conclusion is buttressed by the absence of any real clear evidence that those witnesses had information that would prove the president had committed a crime. The president's public statement could be viewed as efforts to defend himself from public criticism related to the special counsel's investigation or to discourage the witnesses from making what the president believed might be false statements in exchange for a lesser sentence. Bob Mueller has got to look at that and say that is a complete miscodification of what I said. This notion of flipping was just the opposite, that he came to the conclusion that was one of a basis that, that in a, a, a nation, in a Department of Justice where you would have the authority to prosecute a sitting president, that those events... Uh, attempts to uh, subvert, to affect the testimony of people like Paul Manafort and Stone and Cohen and Flynn, Michael Flynn, others were obstructive in nature and should have been addressed either in the political system, uh, through the impeachment process, or or through a criminal prosecution uh, that could have been pursued absent that memorandum. In the end, in the end, the memorandum concludes this with, with this. The special counsels through investigation did not establish that the president committed any underlying crime related to Russian interference. Once again, getting back to this fundamentally in erroneous notion that you need to have an underlying crime to accomplish obstruction in the investigation of that crime. As noted, they went on to say, in every successful obstruction case cited in the report, the corrupt acts were undertaken to prevent the investigation prosecution of a separate crime. The existence of such an offense is not a necessary element, they say, which is to their credit, but the absence of underlying guilt, no underlying guilt here, they say, is relevant and powerful evidence in assessing whether otherwise innocent actions were undertaking with a corrupt motive. 
Um, novel obstruction theories, they describe this as no, just the opposite. In Bob Mueller's report, fundamental statements about the law and the, and the facts uh, undermined and discredited uh, by nothing in this memorandum released this past week. We'll talk more about this in the second hour this morning on Morning Cannolis, and then we're going to move into the other big document released this past week, which is the affidavit in support of the Mar-a-Lago uh, search and seizure. Join us in the second hour of Morning Cannolis, our review of these big stories coming out of Washington, D.C. just this past week. AARP, StoryCorps, and the Ad Council. Welcome. Grab your favorite morning beverage and join us for Morning Cannolis with Jim Santel. You don't know me, but I'm your brother. Sampling the news desserts of the week, here is your host, Jim Santel. Good morning. This is the second hour of Morning Cannolis. We're talking this morning about two very significant documents released this past week on Wednesday, the release by the Department of Justice under court order of this now three-year-old memorandum written to the former Attorney General justifying the publicly announced decision that the Bob Mueller report did not support obstruction of justice charges, a memorandum that is rife with factual misstatements and legal misstatements, as many on all sides of the political aisle are this morning and in the past several days commenting about a document that, depending upon your time as you go forward this beautiful weekend in Wisconsin, other places throughout the Midwest, you may want to pick up and determine whether or not on your own analysis uh, the things that are said in that memorandum are in fact compelling and meaningful. In fact, in fact, we know that history, history flowed from that memorandum and the narrative continues to this day that there was never any obstruction of justice. What is the significance of that? Why is this important even three years later? I'm going to talk more about that at the end of this first, a second hour rather. Uh, but at this time, we'll simply say that the Office of Legal Counsel, as I hinted at during the course of our first hour together, is a, an entity of the Department of Justice that is intended to be the straight shooters, the people who provide the Attorney General. Uh, he or she, uh, with information and insight and direction and legal counsel, that's its name, about things that he or she may be proposing. And this is truly an office that should be speaking truth to power. It is d troubling, troubling at a minimum, that a memorandum inside the Department of Justice, and that's where the Office of Legal Counsel is, responsible to the Attorney General, should author such a document that, again, full of legal misstatements of the law and factual misconduct constructions of the report itself. We'll talk more about the connection between that and then the other big news of this past week, which we're going to get to in this hour, related to the release of the affidavit in support of the search of the Mar-a-Lago residence uh, on early, in early August of this of this year as well, not not in 2019, but just a, a few weeks ago. I should mention as well that next week, next week, once again, we're going to be back here again between 9 and 11 with more stories about uh, law and government, the aspiration of justice, and I'm going to very much uh, welcome uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Don Brown, who, as you know, does this week in Waukesha so very well uh, this morning again from the farmer's market, also does these terrific broadcasts of uh, Friday Night Football right here in Waukesha. Uh, Don, when we were rescheduling our plan to get together this morning uh, wanted me to to know uh, tongue in cheek I'm sure a time for a bit of levity and an otherwise very serious morning of discussion that when he was an alderman uh, here in the great city of Waukesha for many years tremendous service by Don Brown to our community um, and there was never any time that he didn't return all documents uh, to the city that he may have developed or or uh, temporarily maintained while he was in official office and properly returned those at the end of his term uh, when it was up just this past April. And so, Adan, uh, appreciate that that comment and looking forward to talking with you more uh, next week about a number of different issues, including the kinds of things that public servants should be doing. And we're going to spend a lot of time with Don and others in the weeks ahead chatting about the role that government plays and the importance of integrity in all of these kinds of things, including the Office of Legal Counsel. That's a little bit of a hint about what's coming up at the very end of this 
hour as well, the conclusions that we draw from these documents of this past week. Wednesday, Wednesday, the release of this memorandum going back to 2019. And then just yesterday, just yesterday, the release of this 38, 40-page document that is the support describing the probable cause to enter into the personal residence and perhaps office as well of the former president in Mar-a-Lago in Florida. We talked last week before this memorandum, this supporting affidavit came out, before it was released by the magistrate judge, again, upon the concurrence of the attorney general. We talked about where our search warrant comes from, a little bit of recitation of that once again. Search warrant, not a predicate uh, for anything beyond searching. This is not a charging document. No one has been charged with any events related to the retention or or destruction or even maintenance of documents here in Mar-a-Lago. This is an effort in, to investigate whether or not there have been crimes in the nature of improper taking, improper retention, perhaps destruction, perhaps even use of documents in an unofficial and in this instance, perhaps unclassified manner as well. Again, no one, no one, including the former president or any members of his staff, prosecuted, but could in fact, could in fact result in those charges. This a part of an investigation. And so, as we talked last week, as you all know well, um, a magistrate judge, a, a, not a not a Title III judge appointed by a president, but unless appointed by the local judges there for a term of years, his name is Bruce Reinhardt. Um, Way back in early August, the early part of this of this month, Bruce Reinhardt took a look at this 38-page memorandum, this writing by a special agent of the FBI. It's called an affidavit. It's a sworn document. It is a codification. It's a summary of all the information that the special agent had up to that point about what he had gathered in connection with the documents that were known to be at the premises at Mar-a-Lago. I'm describing with some particularity, invoking three statutes, which we'll reference again in just a few moments or so, three statutes that were arguably violated by the fact that these documents are there, transported from the White House to South Florida, uh, perhaps uh, maintained there for purposes we do not know, but nonetheless improperly there because they may be in violation of the Presidential Records Act. They might be in violation of something called the SB. Espionage Act, which again protects uh, information and sensitive information that goes to the security and safety of our nation. And so invoking those particular criminal statutes in the federal law, proposing to this judge, this magistrate judge, that permission be granted judicially to go into that house, to into that those premises described in the search warrant as a mansion, and it is, with many rooms, many bedrooms, and an office called the 45 office, asking permission to go in. Why? Because there's a, a reason to believe there is probable cause in the language of the law to believe that there will be evidence of a crime under these statutes found in that location. Again, not a unilateral uh, initiative by the FBI, not something that the Attorney General or any assistant U.S. attorney or any federal or state officer can simply do upon his decision to go in. It's got to be reviewed by and was reviewed by a federal district court judge who plainly examined it and found probable cause. Again, not to charge anybody at this point, but simply give authorization to do just that. So, in the wake of what we know know to be the issuance of the warrant. Merrick Garland did indeed release previously the cover pages of that warrant. We talked about this at some length last week, a cover warrant that, a cover to the warrant itself that again described the location, this Mar-a-Lago location, what it looks like, what the address is, what the mansion partakes of, where you can go when you go into search, and then the kinds of things that the search warrant authorized uh, that could in fact be seized. And those also, again, uh, part of the document uh, released by the uh, f federal magistrate judge this past week giving permission to the FBI agents under sections 793 and 2071 and 1519 of Title 18, the Criminal Conduct Code of the United States uh, of America, to seize physical documents with classification markings along with boxes in which those documents are located, also including information, communications in any form regarding the retrieval or storage or transmission of national defense information or classified information, uh, 
government materials that may have been taken, a connection with the presidential records uh, responsibilities, and evident, evident, any evidence of alteration, destruction, or concealment uh, of those records. So a very broad mandate by the magistrate judge to go in to the specifically described location for a specific period of time, grabbing these records and bringing them back. And in the wake of that, obviously, news media much interested in knowing the specific basis for probable cause, asked the magistrate judge to release that underlying affidavit. Again, a little bit of civics this morning, as we often do. It is unusual. It is atypical for a search warrant and certainly a, an underlying affidavit to be released, certainly into the public domain, prior to the initiation of any formal prosecution. And so routinely, routinely, most routinely, this is not unprecedented, but most routinely, Routinely. In criminal cases, both federal and state, an investigation, as I said, sometimes partakes of a search. This is one of those events in an investigation. And the mechanism, the mechanism for challenging it, for challenging whether or not this search should have happened, whether there was probable cause, follows, follows the actual charging of an individual or a corporation for violations of the federal law. So routinely, uh, investigation happens, might include a search, seizure of documents. The analysis of those could lead up to a grand jury indictment under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, a return of charges against a person. And then after those charges are issued, the government produces discovery, which would be the results of a search of this sort. And it's in that setting that a defendant, including, for example, the former president, if indeed the decision is made at some point to charge him, it's at that time and that time only that there is a proper basis, a proper procedure status to challenge this this uh, warrant and determine whether or not it was issued in the first place. That's the way the, the federal rules and the federal procedure uh, it contemplates that this happens. Uh, we know that the former president has filed what he described as a motion. Um, to address this. And there's a, a related civil action that could be brought, but that's not the normal procedure for pursuing this. But along the way, plainly, a great national interest in knowing what this affidavit says. And so the news media of all kinds asked the judge in formal pleadings uh, to release the memorandum. And the judge, in a hearing of about a week or so ago, said that he might be inclined to do it. Why? Because there's so much national interest and also because in the wake of the search of early August, an awful lot of misinformation out there, a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding about how this works and what some of the predicates for it were. Just this, this notion that this was not the FBI simply going in unilaterally. There was a finding of probable cause. And so the magistrate judge almost certainly in his oral statements and other things indicating he wants to release something. And so he told the Department of Justice to go back and look at this 38-page non-public document and see if there are things that could be released to the public without compromising the investigation itself. And the Attorney General took that homework seriously, went back, and uh, just a couple of days ago gave the magistrate judge a redacted version that the department said they could live with. And surprisingly, the magistrate judge turned right around and at about noontime yesterday directed that the Department of Justice release that affidavit. That's the subject of the remainder of our discussion here this morning on Morning Cannolis and also inviting your calls, your questions, calling in at 844-967-2789 as we discuss the content of this affidavit in support of the search at Mar-a-Lago. Continue to join with us, have this discussion, and be with us this morning as we talk about this very important issue in the investigation of this matter. We're back once again. This is the second hour on a bright and beautiful morning in downtown Waukesha in the state of Wisconsin talking this morning about this underlying affidavit that supported the decision of federal United States magistrate Bruce Reinhardt to authorize agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation to go into the personal residence and private office of the former president of the United States of America, Donald Trump, in early part of this month, authorizing them to go in based upon a finding of probable cause, as he said, that there would be evidence of a crime in that location. And it's very important to understand that that's the, that's the standard. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but probable cause to believe there's evidence of a crime. The magistrate judge uh, believed the FBI 
in its very compelling presentation in this 38 to 48 page document and authorized that entry into those premises and the seizure of documents earlier this month. A couple of things about this affidavit. It's important to know as we talk through it in the remaining time that we have together this morning, uh, chatting about the underlying predicates for this search and seizure. One is, yes, it's about 38, 48 pages. As you know well, great portions of it redacted, meaning uh, there is black, <laughs> black on virtually every page, almost every page of the affidavit that was publicly released. Why did that happen? Well, there's also a memorandum attached to the materials released along with the affidavit in which the Department of Justice describes its concerns about releasing more than that, uh, concerns about the witnesses were plainly identified during the course of this writing, concerns about the future of the investigation, giving a, a roadmap to the world, including the potential targets for it, concerns about privacy interests, uh, concerns about other things related to grand jury secrecy. And we're going to chat about those, time permitting, at the very end of this hour. So the document itself, plainly, at some point down the road, historically, we will get the entire document, but probably not for a long period of time, maybe sometime in the years just ahead. But right now, we've got a document that about half of which, half of which is redacted, and the guts of it, the, the serious portion of it, that real finding a probable cause is not there. That is, that is, it's not produced. It's there in the document, but it's not produced for public consumption appropriately. A decision made by the magistrate judge not to compromise the integrity of the investigation, not to further expose witnesses who came forward to support this presentation by the FBI, to do things right as the, uh, he and other magistrate judges normally would, other judges normally would. And so we have a, a significant amount of information we do not know about this, but that's not to indicate at all, as some had indicated, that there is not probable cause, simply that this, again, would be in a very appropriate way to proceed in this already atypical situation where you're releasing a, an affidavit prior to the charging of any particular individual. So what does the, oh, say half or so of the affidavit that we do have in front of us, what does it tell us about this investigation and in particular this search of the Mar-a-Lago president? Well, we know that a lot of this comes from the United States National Archives and Records Administration. Basically, the National Archives, lots of references to NARA, and that's the acronym, the National Archives and Records Administration. We know that this began began with 15 boxes of records and specifically some boxes obtained by NARA, by the National Archives, that prompted all of this to go forward. That was the genesis of this concern about documents at Mar-a-Lago. Even before we get to that, an awful lot of descriptive information in the first pages of the affidavit about the reasons why there is indeed probable cause. And let me read out loud the significant language um, on page two of the underlying affidavit. It says, there is probable cause to believe that documents that contain classified uh, information or that our presidential records subject to records retention requirements currently remain at the premises. And by the premises, that means Mar-a-Lago. Interestingly, significantly, caught my eye, caught the eye of many other people looking at this, uh, even in its redacted form. There is also probable cause to believe that evidence of obstruction will be found at the premises. That's something we did not previously know. Uh, harkens back to our discussion in the first hour of our time together today. That is obstruction related to the uh, investigation of the Russia matter way back in 2017 and 18 and 19. Once again, this word obstruction surfaces. We don't know a whole lot more about that. And there's not a lot of exposition because presumably that's inside the portions of this document that are redacted. But very significant that once again, Again, we have got an allegation here that there is probable cause to believe that obstruction of justice happened, even in connection with these documents being taken from the White House and then ultimately ending back at, at Mar-a-Lago. So again, how does this how does this all get underway? What is the what do we know based upon what the magistrate judge has released uh, described to him by the FBI? It says this on February 9th of this year, 2022, a special agent of NARA's office, okay, the office of the Inspector General, set a, sent a referral to the Department of Justice. Very appropriate 
Department of Justice, of course, being the entity that that prosecutes crimes um, identified by citizens, by you and me, uh, by entities, by corporations, uh, by groups, but also by other agencies. So, and so in this case, basically, the National Archives, NARA, says we think there's something of a concern here based upon some work we have undertaken up to this point to try to get documents back from Mar-a-Lago that may have been taken improperly out of the White House. The affidavit, the portions of it that are not redacted, go on to say this. The referral from NARA stated that, according to NARA's White House Liaison Division Director, a preliminary review of some 15 boxes already returned by the former president to the National Archives indicated that they contained, and this is a quote, newspapers, magazines, printed news articles, photos, miscellaneous printouts, notes, presidential correspondence, personal and post-presidential records, and, quote, a lot of classified records. This, again, according to the referral made by the National Archives to the Department of Justice about whether or not there should be some further inquiry. Again, going on, in the same paragraph, this is on page 8 of the affidavit, of most concern was the highly classified records that were unfolded intermixed with other records and otherwise improperly identified. Um, All sorts of indications there that you've got a lot of documents there. Um, And again, many of them intermixed, not properly folded, not properly classified going forward. That's what the NARA has. That's what they refer to the Department of Justice to pursue. And so what do we know about this? We know that in May, again, based upon the affidavit, uh, in May of 2021, even before that referral is made, NARA made a request for the missing records and continued to make requests until about late uh, December of 2021 um, when the NARA was informed these boxes were found and ready for retrieval from the president's uh, premises. And that initiates once again the engagement of the Department of Justice that results ultimately in this affidavit and the search of the premises. We're going to chat more about what we do know coming out of this affidavit right after the break, right here on Morning Cannolis. Join us if you will at 844 2781 right here in the Shaw and Waukesha. Thank you for once again joining me. This is Jim Santel, Morning Cannolis, talking with you and encouraging your phone calls also at 844-967-2789 right here at the Shaw in downtown Waukesha in connection with our review this morning of what we do know, what we do know about the affidavit that was presented by an FBI agent to the magistrate judge in South Florida to justify the search and seizure of documents at Mar-a-Lago, the present and former, uh, 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 the present location, a residence of the former president, uh, Donald Trump. I was talking before the break about how we get into this, how the, the affidavit describes the beginning of this investigation, in particular, this referral from the National Archives, NARA, this acronym, uh, over to the Department of Justice based upon the review of these 15 boxes that it had in fact gotten, including lots of classified records, and frankly, sort of a mess of unfolded, intermixed with other records, other improperly identified documents, uh, calling attention to the fact that some of them are classified in nature. And so in the wake of that referral, what happens? We know once again from the affidavit now disclosed as of yesterday that between May and May 16th and May 18th of this year, 2022, FBI agents conducted a preliminary review of those boxes. They went through them. This is part of the investigation. They get this referral from the National Archives and says, we've got some peculiarities here in terms of things we got back from the president's personal residence um, after his term in office. And the FBI agents go through that and they they identify documents with classification markings in 14 of the 15 boxes okay 14 of the 15 boxes they say a preliminary triage of those documents with classification markings revealed this and you probably have seen the numbers you've heard about this already in the media 184 unique documents bearing classification markings 67 of those mark confidential 92 mark secret 25 mark top secret in addition um, FBI agents observed markings reflecting the following compartments dissemination controls, as they're described. And here are the acronyms HCS, FISA, FISA, 
Orcon, no foreign, and SI. Based upon my training, training experience, the FBI agent says in the affidavit, I know that documents classified at these levels typically contain national defense information or NDI. Several of the documents also contained what appear to be uh, the former president's handwritten notes. Now, what do all those those acronyms mean? HCS is a reference significantly to documents that could reveal clandestine human intelligence sources. In addition to this reference early on to the fact that there may be some obstruction going on here, this I think is the other major really important thing coming out of this affidavit disclosure. What are human intelligence sources? Well, you might think, gee, those are people coming forward, and certainly that is the case. It means more than that in the context of classified materials, which this focus is all about. We're talking here about people who are a part of our national service, our foreign service, our spies who are located in nations both friendly and unfriendly around the world. The great concern by people at the CIA, I had a fair amount of exposure to this when I was in Iraq myself, great concern about human intelligence sources and the fact that some of these documents might include identifications of people who are in these very clandestine, very secretive, very sensitive positions that is huge, and that is no small matter as you understand what HCS means and why it is the FBI was taking this so very seriously. FISA is a reference to national security surveillance. ORCON is a reference uh, to a special system of controls in which the person who originally marks something as classified has to be consulted before it's shared with anybody else beyond those who were pre-approved for it. No foreign means the information cannot be shared with foreign governments. Again, if it's if if it's in that category, lots of things when I was in Iraq in that category, do not share these with any foreign foreign governments, an indication that these are not simply records of speeches or random notes about appearances in the public uh, domestic uh, venues here in America. These are things related to our connections with and even our investigation, our clandestine investigations of foreign nations and our secret service, our, our secret agents in those those. Uh, entities. SI, a reference to a system for so-called sensitive compartmented information, which is an extra set of limits over and above all these other categories uh, that's meant to protect technical and intelligence information, again, related to a surveillance of foreign communications. Again, all of that. Why, why do I go into all that? It underscores the significance of the documents that were found in these 15 original documents. Um, these are not, as I just indicated, simply notes, uh, speeches given, uh, communications uh, about very important and perhaps also not public, but nonetheless, things that did not involve uh, foreign uh, involvement and uh, issues related to our national security. Basically, a clear statement in this affidavit that this is significant. This is hugely important. Uh, human, human sensitivities here, uh, human sources, human intelligence in the nature of things going on over Sees a large portion, as I indicated, a huge major core of this affidavit is redacted. And so we do not know about it. What it means is that there's an awful lot of information here supporting the notion that there is probable cause based upon the review of these 15 documents to go in to believe that there is more, more beyond what was uh, simply provided in those 15 documents. We know as well, based upon separate reporting and also indications in the affidavit that in the wake of all of this happening, there were multiple attempts by the Department of Justice and others to get those additional documents back. There was an initial outreach by virtue of a letter. There was a grand jury subpoena in June of this year, likewise uh, issued to the lawyers for the former president. A reference, an, an admission, a statement uh, by a counsel from the former president in the summer of this year indicating that everything had been produced, no more things to, to acquire, nothing else to be seized at Mar-a-Lago, a statement, a representation, plainly uh, not true, belied by the fact that the Department of Justice went back and said, nope, there's still more information there. They then got the search warrant after increasing, if you will, the, the requests, the demands, going from a simple request to a grand jury subpoena, finally to a search warrant, seeking the, the uh, recovery of these additional documents. Along the way, along the way, on page 22, they also note, plainly because of some surveillance, uh, perhaps some uh, 
video accounting of what's going on there, that uh, there is, in fact, a concern about the, maintain, uh, the maintenance and the retention of those documents at Mar-a-Lago, even as attempts to requ- acquire them are going forward. Uh, a, a letter written by the Department of Justice to counsel for the president in uh, June of this year says, we ask that the room at Mar-a-Lago where the documents have been stored be secured and that all of the boxes that were moved from the White House to Mar-a-Lago, along with any other items in that room, be preserved in that room in their current condition until further notice. In other words, some concern, again, this is in the affidavit, that these documents are even being moved around, perhaps, at Mar-a-Lago. Additional, long periods, long portions of the affidavit that are not disclosed in support of probable cause, ultimately coming to this finding, this this recommendation, this, this finding based upon information deemed to be reliable, based upon witnesses, other documents, all the information assembled in this past summer. This finding on page 26, there is probable cause to believe that documents containing classified NDI, NDI, national defense information, and presidential records remain on the premises. And again, those premises, Mar-a-Lago. Again, that's the basis upon which the magistrate judge finds probable cause to go back in. And significantly on page 29, again, non-redacted, the locations of where those documents might be, including the 45 office, other spaces in that location. Uh, Paragraph 78 says this, evidence of the subject offenses has been stored in multiple locations at the premises. This is not just in one location, multiple locations, uh, haphazardly maintained and in various locations around the estate described in the affidavit. A very interesting insight, again, not to not to the specifics about probable cause here. That was plainly there, but we just don't know about it. But nonetheless, um, a lot of indications about the, the genesis of this investigation, where it was, why there was such concern over time, beginning in the early months of this year, ultimately culminating in this search warrant in August. What happens now? What happens now? Well, even the, the affidavit itself describes that as well. Uh, this is a part of routine practice. Again, even more civics this morning uh, to chat with you about. In the wake of a, a retrieval of this sort, a production, if you will, through the FBI seizure of documents, not unusual for the Department of Justice, a U.S. Attorney's Office, Maine Justice, any of the entities there responsible for the oversight of an investigation and prosecution. Not at all unusual. As a matter of fact, routine and expected. It is ethical, it's right, to establish what's called a privilege review team. And what was the purpose of that that team also described in this affidavit? To ensure that any potentially attorney-client privileged information between the president and his counsel are not properly, uh, that are were seized during the course of this, identified and returned, and are not a part of the investigation going forward. We're going to talk more about that right after the following break. Again, here at Morning Cannolis, chatting about this affidavit and then drawing some conclusions about this document and the other document that we talked about this morning. Join us here at WAUK, the Shaw, in downtown Waukesha. And now, our last moments in this segment here in Morning Cannolis as we begin to conclude our discussion, our presentation of the content of what we know about the affidavit in support of the Mar-a-Lago search in early August. Right before the break, I was talking about this very appropriate procedure, again, described right in the context, right in the text of the memorandum itself, this affidavit, setting up this review process, this privilege review team. This should be a source of great comfort and great great satisfaction, if you will, to all Americans who, who may not previously know about this process. Anytime a search warrant is executed, especially at a place of a personal residence, especially at a place where there can, in fact, be privileged attorney-client materials. What happens? Those documents go back to a privilege review team. These are people, again, inside the government, but they're not involved in the investigation itself. They've got no involvement up to that point. They will have no involvement down the road in the investigation itself, charging decisions, other things. They are charged simply with looking through all the materials, which in this case is going to be huge, and determining whether any 
anything in those documents, anything in those documents is in the nature of private, privileged, protected communications between, in this case, the former president and his counsel about things that he can and should and is legally entitled to talk with his attorneys about. That review will take place. A number of different remedies. In fact, if you do disclose, identify those materials, they can be returned. They can be uh, presented to a judge for an in-camera review. The ultimate point behind all that is none of that, none of that can be, should be, will you be used in the further investigation of this case, a privilege review team already put in place um, in the affidavit itself. And so um, in connection with that and moving forward, the Department of Justice, as I indicated previously, also attaches um, to this affidavit a memorandum in which it explains exactly the reasons why it it has redacted the document in the way it has. Again, um, support Supporting this notion that probable cause is there, it is in virtually half of the document, but nonetheless, if it's released today, would compromise the investigation. And sure enough, the uh, Department of Justice says one of the concerns is the disclosure of the affidavit, uh, quoting again right from the, the content of that supplemental memorandum, would like to result in witnesses being quickly and broadly identified over social media and other communication channels, which could lead to them being harassed and intimidated. Uh, the Department of Justice goes on to note the court, this court, the one issuing the the, the uh, search warrant, gave great weight to the significant likelihood that unsealing the affidavit would harm legitimate privacy interests with disclosures potentially serving to impede the ongoing investigation through obstruction of justice and witness intimidation or retaliation. These great concerns once again about obstruction of justice and about the possibility that even in the wake of this, there could be attempts to intimidate witnesses, to coerce testimony in one way or another, to affect the course of justice in a way that we've spent a lot of time this morning talking about obstructive behaviors. Interestingly, on uh, one of the paragraphs in this affidavit, the Department of Justice goes on to say this, the court cited in its prior finding of probable cause that a statute prohibiting obstruction of justice has been violated and further relied upon the post-search increase in specific threats of violence to identified FBI agents, overall threats to FBI personnel, and the armed attack on the FBI office in Cincinnati. All of those things related to reasons why the more specific, the more expansive, extensive disclosures cannot and should be made. The summary of all this, the summary of all this is, is on page four of this memorandum. Um, the Department of Justice says this, the government has carefully reviewed the affidavit, identified five categories of information that must remain under seal to protect the safety of multiple civilian witnesses whose information was included throughout the affidavit and contributed to the finding of probable cause as well as the integrity of the ongoing investigation. And they attach a chart that describes specifically the kinds of things that are being redacted here and they identify these categories as these. One, information from a broad range of civilian witnesses who may be subject to witness intimidation or retaliation. Again, a very great concern here as this goes forward. Uh, number two, information regarding investigative avenues and techniques that could provide a roadmap, this roadmap concept, for potential ways to obstruct the investigation. Number three, information whose disclosure is prohibited under grand jury secrecy, a thing called Rule 6C of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Number four, information whose disclosure would risk the safety of law enforcement personnel. Again, as, as we just heard in this other portion portion of the, of the memorandum itself, and then information would disc that would harm legitimate privacy interests of people of third parties also involved in this. Again, justification for doing all of this with respect to the legitimacy of the future investigation and, and especially, especially safety and security of the people who are uh, a part of this process going forward. Uh, that's a very brief, if you will, um, summary of what the affidavit, as far as we know, as what it says. What is the reason why this is important? I promised uh, during the course of our time today that I would spend some time at the end of our, our discussion this morning talking about the reasons why both of these documents are important. Well, you, you plainly have figured it out. We've got these continuing references to obstruction of justice, both in the memorandum released uh, by the Department of Justice this past year. This focus on getting uh, uh, obstruction 
understood, number one. But number two, the notion that obstruction of justice underlies uh, the very, uh, it can undermine, rather, rule of law. It can undermine legitimate investigations. And we see again, as late as yesterday, that one of the concerns of the FBI in connection with the uh, retention, the maintenance of these documents at Mar-a-Lago is that there may have been obstruction even in that. We don't know what that's about. There's virtually nothing in the affidavit to describe that as it has been disclosed. But that is a key portion of the government's focus. It was a key portion of Bob Mueller's investigation, uh, findings that, in fact, the president had engaged in obstructive behavior, even though he's never charged, never impeached for that. And once again, we've got this concern by the Department of Justice about obstruction even even in connection with these documents at Mar-a-Lago. Um, second, second, the importance of speaking truth uh, to power. We talked about that in connection with the Office of Legal Counsel. It has this responsibility, should have this responsibility, of describing honestly and candidly what it is that the facts show, what the law is all about. Um, a document that, once again, even though we do not have half of it, plainly in its meticulous description of what we do have, in the categories of things that are described, we've got a lot of information here. Why? Because it's important for power, in this case the magistrate judge, to have a full and complete understanding of the law and the facts. And both of those are unmistakably described here, even though we do not have in great detail the specific findings of probable cause here. This is a fundamental notion of how government works and should work. Internal to the Department of Justice, the Office of Legal Counsel should be that straight shooter, should be that entity that describes to any attorney general honestly and in in a candid manner, the good, the bad, the indifferent, everything in between. And we plainly know now this past week that at least with respect to the Mueller report, that did not happen in a prior administration. Uh, we also know now that in connection with the FBI, like any agency, not perfect. No entity in America is government or extra government. No, no entity perfect, but nonetheless, a meticulous attempt over many months to try to retain these documents, to recover them, uh, to work with counsel, and ultimately getting this affidavit based upon a huge amount, uh, probably 15, maybe 16, 17 pages of described testimony from individuals, presumably there on site, we're able to establish probable cause for the presence of these classified documents that may in fact be in violation. Their very presence there, their retention, maybe their destruction, maybe their obstruction in some way um, could be in violation of federal law. Speaking again, truth to power, in this case, a federal magistrate judge who has got the very important obligation to determine whether or not probable cause exists. Um, the notion, once again, that in the wake of this, the investigation goes forward. And the significance in all of this of having the right people in the right places to do this kind of work, yes, FBI agents, yes, assistant U.S. attorneys, yes, people from NARA at the National Archives who come forward initially and say, we think we've got a problem here, all these kinds of things. Why? Because ultimately, ultimately, government is people. We talk a lot about the structures of government, the FBI, the Office of Legal Counsel, the Department of Justice, the Office of the Attorney General, U.S. Attorneys, offices of U.S. Attorneys nationwide. Ultimately, those are structures, and they are how the government is formulated and works. Ultimately, however, as you all know, government is really about people. It's about the people who inhabit those all-important positions. Where do they come from ultimately? Well, many of them are appointed. And where do those appointments come from? They come from elected officers. You get attorneys general. You get um, all sorts of other people from presidents who appoint a director of the FBI. Um, the director of the FBI hires special agents. Um, federal district court judge identify uh, magistrate judges who make these determinations. It all comes from voting. It all comes from Americans involved in their government to ensure that the people at these highest levels are the kinds of folks who should be there uh, pursuing the rule of law day in and day out. We're going to continue this discussion next week, as I indicate, a special guest coming in, planned for today, but instead going to be coming in next week, Don Brown, former uh, attorney, uh, uh, alderman here in, in Waukesha, going to come in and talk about the importance of government and the role that he played in ensuring that the right people in the right place at the right time, Don Brown, plainly one of those folks, um, chatting uh, with us about 
the rule of law in America, the law of government, the aspiration for justice, the way that works. Join us again next week, 9 to 10, 9 to 11, uh, here on the, on the Shaw in downtown Waukesha, 5.40 a.m., 101 FM. Thank you so much for engaging with me this morning. We'll talk with you again, be with you again next week. Be safe. Take care.